Okay, um, welcome to the back end of chapter 27. Um, this is the final installment of the reproductive system. And what we're going to address first off today is the ovarian cycle. Now, what we have to remember about the female reproductive system is that two things have to happen, and they have to be timed perfectly, which are, which are the uterine cycle and the ovarian cycle. The ovarian cycle simply describes the series of events that eventually leads to the production of an egg, which will then be um, delivered from the follicle that sits inside the ovary and be introduced into the fallopian tube. And then if there are sperm in the area, we can affect fertilization, the production of a zygote, and then eventually the generation of a new human being. But it also involves um, the uterine cycle, which is essentially the home for the conceptus for nine months. And so both of these things have to operate correctly in order for reproduction to take place. So during childhood, the female's ovaries grow and secrete small amounts of estrogens that inhibit hypothalamic release of gonadotropin releasing hormone. Remember that the hypothalamus is that area on the floor of the brain that sits just above the pituitary gland that acts on the pituitary gland via releasing hormones that are um, placed into the hypothalamic hypophysial portal system. So gonadotropin releasing hormone is um, basically silenced during this period, but as puberty nears, gonadotropin releasing hormone is released and this results in the secretion of follicle stimulating and luteinizing hormone by the anterior pituitary, which are then going to act on the ovaries. These events continue until an adult cyclic pattern is achieved and menarche occurs. Menarche is the first menstrual period, the first menstrual period. Hormone interaction produces the cyclic events in the ovaries. GnRH and pituitary gonadotropins act together to spur the production of ovarian estrogen and progesterone. The onset of puberty is linked to the amount of adipose tissue via the hormone leptin, which is actually generated by the adipose tissue. Uh, if you don't have adequate amounts of leptin, you will not enter the hormonal changes that are associated with puberty. In fact, many female athletes that keep a minimum of body fat often have late onset of puberty due to the minimal amount of adipose tissue uh, in a lean, uh, trim, uh, muscular physique. During childhood and until puberty, the ovaries secrete small amounts of estrogen, which inhibits the release of GnRH. If leptin levels are adequate, the hypothalamus becomes less sensitive to estrogen as puberty nears. This results in the release of gonadotropin-releasing hormone in pulses that stimulate FSH and LH release, which then act on the ovaries to spur them to generate now their hormones, estrogen, and progesterone. Gonadotropin levels increase for approximately four years, uh, during which time there is no ovulation and no pregnancy. Then the adult cyclic pattern is achieved, and we have menarche, which is, again, the first menstrual period. Three years before the cycle, regular, um, three years before the cycle is regular, and all of the ovulatory events are um, capable of taking place. So there's a, there's a, period of time where we have to sort of stabilize these secretions in order to generate now um, the, the egg within its mature follicle and also synchronize the events that take place in the uterus. So if we look at the sequence of events, gonadotropin releasing hormone spurs the release of follicle stimulating and luteinizing hormone which spur the release of, um, uh, which spur the development rather of follicles inside the ovary, and also spurs the release of estrogen and progesterone from the ovary as well. This increase in plasma estrogen levels inhibits the release of FSH and LH. This is our negative feedback loop. Uh, this also enhances further estrogen output. Inhibin from the granulosa cells also inhibits FSH release. The granulosa cells are components of the ovarian follicle, and we'll see uh, where, there's, where those are located later on in the talk.
When estrogen levels get high enough, there's a brief positive feedback on the brain and the anterior pituitary. Stored LH and FSH suddenly are released by the anterior pituitary at mid-cycle, and this is the surge that triggers ovulation. This leads to the primary oocyte um, completing meiosis 1, which then produces now the secondary oocyte and the first polar body. The secondary oocyte then enters meiosis 2, and then it will freeze in the, uh, at the midpoint of meiosis 2 after um, metaphase has been achieved, waiting for two events, which are ovulation and fertilization. Meiosis 2 doesn't complete until those two events have been executed. What does LH do at mid-cycle? Well, it increases local vascular permeability, which triggers an inflammatory response. Metalloproteinases weaken the ovarian wall. Blood flow stops through the protruding follicle wall. The wall thins, bulges, and then it ruptures with the help of the fimbrae of the fallopian tube brushing across its surface. This results then uh, in the exit of an oocyte with its corona radiata. The corona radiata are follicle cells that will essentially cloak the oocyte, protecting it from the female's immune system so that she doesn't destroy her own gametes. After ovulation, the estrogen levels will decline. LH will then transform the remaining follicle into a structure called the corpus luteum. This is Latin for yellow body. And this will become a temporary endocrine organ for the course of the pregnancy or for the remainder of the menstrual cycle. The corpus luteum will form and then generate progesterone and some estrogen almost immediately, which helps to maintain the endometrial lining of the uterus, specifically the stratum functionalis. This will also help to maintain pregnancy if it occurs. The corpus luteum, in turn, is maintained by climbing levels of human chorionic gonadotrophin as the conceptus implants in the endometrial lining. Finally, negative feedback from rising plasma, progesterone, and estrogen levels inhibits LH and FSH release because we don't want another ovulation to take place if we're already either on the road to fertilizing uh, an ovulated egg or if we have, in fact, implanted in the uterus. Inhibin from the corpus luteum and the granulosa cells enha enhances this effect. Declining luteinizing hormone levels ends the luteal activity and inhibits follicle development. If there is no fertilization, the corpus luteum will degenerate when luteinizing hormone levels drop. This will result in a sharp decrease in estrogen and progesterone production and will end the blockage of FSH and LH secretion, at which point those levels will continue to rise. The cycle will then start over again. The oocyte is actually activated 12 months prior to ovulation. So what you're looking here is just a map showing you um, the interactions that we just detailed from the initial GnRH surge that leads to the release of follicle stimulating and luteinizing hormone, FSH effects on the follicle inside the ovary, LH effects on both the, the thecal cells, the androgens, the granulosa cells, and the production of eventually estrogens, uh, which now begin to accumulate and cause the follicle to mature even further, leading to um, positive feedback at uh, the mid-cycle phase, the mid-follicular phase on both the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary, which leads now to an LH surge, which will cause the follicle to rupture we now ovulate the egg with the associated corona radiata. The uh, remaining structure then um, develops into the corpus luteum in the cortex of the ovary and now becomes a progesterone and estrogen um, generating endocrine organ that will, along with inhibin, um, produce a negative feedback relationship on both the hypothalamus and the uh, posterior pituitary. Uh, resulting now in a decrease in the amount of LH and FSH. And the reason for that, again, is that we don't want another follicle to mature while we're attempting to establish this pregnancy.
Back over here to the uh, early and mid follicular phase, what we can also note here is the fact that inhibin and estrogens, as they begin to accumulate after the um, the mild surge in FSH and LH uh, that is produced as we now tap a particular follicle for maturation, uh, that these elevated uh, estrogen and inhibin levels will inhibit FSH secretion um, at the end of the mid follicular phase, and then it will be now a sudden surge in the amount of estrogens that are produced by the maturing follicle that ultimately will result in now the production of the LH and FSH surge that will bring about ovulation. Okay, what we're looking at here is the fluctuation of gonadotropin levels in the plasma during the ovarian cycle. These fluctuating levels of pituitary gonadotropins, FSH and LH in the blood will regulate the events in the ovarian cycle and here you can see the spike of LH and FSH which just precedes ovulation and then at that point we establish the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum will then secrete estrogens and progesterones that are going to now have an, both a negative feedback effect on the hypothalamus and the pituitary as well as uh, maintain now the stratum functionalis of the endometrium in the uterus. And here we're looking at the events in the ovarian cycle. Structural changes in the ovarian follicles during the cycle are correlated with changes in the endometrium of the uterus during the uterine cycle. The idea here is that we have to prepare the uterus for implantation of the potential conceptus before it actually arrives. And so what will happen is that the endometrial lining will begin to thicken in preparation for the arrival of the zygote. So here you can see the progression from primary to secondary follicle to mature follicle, also known as graphene. Uh, we then proceed to ovulation. The remaining follicle becomes the corpus luteum, which, as we indicated, will maintain the endometrial lining. In the event of an implantation, the chorion will produce human chorionic gonadotropin, which will in turn maintain the corpus luteum for the nine months of the pregnancy. If, however, we fail to have fertilization and there's no implantation, the corpus luteum will degenerate and become now the corpus albicans, and as a result, the amounts of estrogen and progesterone will begin to fall. So if we now switch our attention to the uterine cycle, we note that cyclic changes in the endometrium occur in response to fluctuating ovarian hormone levels. And there's three phases in the uterine cycle. The first five days, which mark the menstrual phase. The um, next eight days, which mark the proliferative phase. And then the final, um, it's approximately, call it 14 days or so, that mark the secretory phase um, again, this is approximately 14 days in length, give or take. So let's address the first phase. The menstrual phase, ovarian hormones are present at their lowest levels. The gonadotropin levels begin to rise and the stratum functionalis is shed. This results in menstrual flow for the next three to five days. By day five, growing ovarian follicles will produce more estrogen. In the proliferative phase, rising estrogen levels prompt generation of a new stratum functionalis. Increased synthesis of progesterone receptors in the endometrium occurs and glands enlarge and the spiral arteries increase in number. And the spiral arteries are what are going to bring the blood to the functional layer of the endometrium as it begins to thicken in preparation for implantation of the conceptus. Uh, normally thick cervical mucus thins in response to rising estrogen levels and this allows easier sperm passage. Ovulation generally occurs at the end of the proliferative phase. In the secretory phase, um, what we have is a pretty solid approximate two-week time frame uh, 
where the endometrium prepares for the embryo and rising progesterone levels trigger the functional layer to um, generate now a secretory mucosa. The endometrial glands begin to secrete nutrients and we have formation of a cervical mucus plug. And um, this is an evolutionary leftover. Uh, what the mucus plug uh, was designed to do uh, was to impede the passage of any further sperm into the uterus and up through the fallopian tubes. If fertilization fails to occur, the corpus luteum will begin to degenerate towards the end of the secretory phase and this will result in falling progesterone levels. This results in the spiral arteries kinking and resulting in a, a drop in blood flow to the stratum functionalis resulting in endometrial cell death, and this is actually necrosis. This is one of the few physiological responses that uh, necrosis plays a role in. Uh, most other uh, physiological cell death falls under the umbrella of apoptosis or programmed cell death, where here we actually see the endometrial cells die due to insult or injury, in this case a lack of blood flow. The spiral arteries constrict again and then relax and open. The rush of blood fragments the weakened capillary beds and the functional layer begins to slough off. So what you're looking at here are the fluctuating ovarian hormone levels during um, this portion of the cycle. We're looking here at plasma hormone level. Estrogen is the brown trace. Progesterone is the green trace. And what we see is that fluctuating levels of ovarian hormones cause endometrial changes in the uterine cycle. The high estrogen levels are also responsible for the LH-FSH surge that we saw in the ovarian cycle a couple of slides back. And what you're looking at here are the three phases of the uterine cycle. In the menstrual phase, the functional layer of the endometrium is shed, while in the proliferative phase, the functional layer of the endometrium is rebuilt. Okay, so you can see that here. This is the menstrual phase, this is the proliferative, and this is the secretory phase. This is the nutrition phase. Okay? In the secretory phase, we begin um, generating now nutrients for the potential conceptus. This usually happens immediately after ovulation. Enrichment of the blood supply and the glandular secretion of the nutrients prepare the endometrium for the conceptus, for the implantation. Both the menstrual and proliferative phases occur prior to ovulation and together they correspond to the follicular phase of the ovarian cycle. The secretory phase corresponds in time to the luteal phase of the ovarian cycle. So what we want to address now are the effects of estrogens. Remember that estrogens are steroid hormones and as a result their receptors lie inside their target tissues in the cytoplasm. They promote oogenesis and follicle growth in the ovary and exert an anabolic effect on the female reproductive tract, meaning that um, tissue in the female reproductive tract engages in biosynthesis. It also supports rapid but short-lived growth spurts at puberty. Other effects include the induction of secondary sex characteristics such as the growth of breast tissue and an increased deposit of subcutaneous fat in the hips and in the breast, and this gives the characteristic uh, female body type. It also results in a widening and lightening of the pelvis, and this is so that the um, the child can pass through the birth canal. Okay, if you've looked at a, a male pelvis and a female pelvis, what you'll see is that the pubic angle is much wider in the female pelvis, and the pelvic inlet and outlet are much wider as well. And these are effects, again, brought about by the production of estrogens. There's also a metabolic effect. Um, what happens here is that we maintain low total blood cholesterol and high HDL levels, and, this also, and also we uh, facilitate calcium uptake. What does progesterone do? Remember that progesterone is also generated during this phase of the menstrual cycle. It works with estrogen to establish and regulate the uterine cycle, and it promotes changes in the cervical mucus. It also um, affects the placental progesterone levels during pregnancy. It inhibits uterine motility, and it helps prepare the breasts for lactation.
that's milk production and that's in preparation for the child to nurse after birth. Now we want to address the female sexual response. It's initiated by touch and psychological stimuli. The clitoris, the vaginal mucosa, and the bulbs of the vestibule and breasts will engorge with blood and the nipples and the clitoris will become erect. The vestibular gland secretions will lubricate the vestibule in preparation for intromission of the penis. Orgasm is accomplished by muscle tension, an increase in pulse rate, and blood pressure, as well as the rhythmic contractions of the uterus. And the idea here is to uh, give a little assistance to the semen so that the male gamete can make its way through the female reproductive tract, up through the uterus, and eventually to the fallopian tube. Females have no refractory period after orgasm and as a result can experience multiple orgasm in a single sexual experience, but this is not essential for conception. Female libido is prompted by uh, the compound dehydropriandrosterone, which is abbreviated DHEA. This is an adrenal cortical hormone. Remember that the adrenal cortex is the outer layer of the adrenal gland the part that is superficial to the medulla and deep to the capsule. And this is going to be the inner layer of the cortex that produces this compound. We also want to address sexually transmitted infections, also known as STDs or venereal disease. The U.S. has the highest rate of infection among developed countries. However, latex condoms can prevent the, the spread, but a uh, cautionary note here, um, any latex product is going to have holes in it. That's just the nature of the manufacturer of this particular product. As a result, um, viruses can pass through latex condoms if they're small enough, so it's not an absolute safeguard against um, all forms of sexually transmitted diseases. It's the single most important cause of reproductive disorder. The first up is gonorrhea. Um, it's a bacterial infection of the mucosa of the reproductive and urinary tracts, and it's spread by contact with the genital, anal, and pharyngeal mucosa. The number of cases in the United States is declining, primarily due to appropriate sex education. Signs and symptoms in males include urethritis, that's an inflammation of the urethra, followed by painful urination and discharge of pus, indicating that we're fighting an infection. In females, 20% display no signs and symptoms, so they're asymptomatic. We also see abdominal discomfort, vaginal discharge, and abnormal uterine bleeding. And it can result in pelvic inflammatory disease as well as sterility. The treatment is antibiotics, but resistant strains are becoming prevalent as most bacterial infections are evolving in the face of the use of antibiotics. Um, if we sort of think about the way that antibiotics work, what they basically do is attack certain biochemical processes that take place in bacteria. However, because of the ability of bacteria to pass genetic information between adjacent cells, in the event that we utilize an antibiotic in an improper fashion, in other words, the patient fails to take the full course of the drug um, as prescribed by the doctor, we can select for resistant strains of those particular bacteria. And if they come into contact with other pathogens, they can exchange the genetic material that contains the resistance genes with those other strains. In the event that those other strains contain other types of drug resistance, what can occur is that you can get multi-drug resistant strains of bacteria that are extremely virulent and difficult to treat with even the most powerful broad spec antibiotics. We now have certain forms of venereal disease that are resistant to up to 20 different broad and narrow spec antibiotics at the same time. And it's because of this phenomena of non-compliance uh, between the patient and the clinician. Okay, syphilis is a bacterial infection transmitted sexually or contracted congenitally. Infected fetuses are often stillborn or die shortly after birth. The infection in adults is asymptomatic for two to three weeks. And then we see a painless chancre that appears at the site of the infection, 
which will then spontaneously disappear. If untreated, secondary signs will appear several weeks later for 3 to 12 weeks and then disappear. These include a pink skin rash, fever, and joint pain. In the latent period, we may or may not progress to tertiary syphilis, which is characterized by lesions in the central nervous system, um, disorder of the blood vessels, bones, and skin. And this can also often lead to uh, cognitive deficit and psychosis. The treatment is antibiotics, penicillin being the most popular. Chlamydia is the most common bacterial um, sexually transmitted infection in the U.S., and it's responsible for almost 50% of all diagnosed cases of PID. The symptoms include urethritis, penile and vaginal discharge, abdominal, rectal, or testicular pain, painful intercourse, and irregular menses. It can also cause arthritis and urinary tract infections, UTIs in men. It can lead to sterility in women. Newborns in contact with um, this pathogen in the birth canal can experience trachoma, which is an eye infection, as well as respiratory inflammation. The treatment is tetracycline, again an antibiotic. Trichomoniasis is the most common curable sexually transmitted infection in active young women in the U.S. It's a parasitic infection, but it's easily and inexpensively treated. Characterized by a yellow-green vaginal discharge with a strong odor, but sometimes this is asymptomatic. Genital warts are a viral infection caused by the human papillomavirus. This is the second most common sexually transmitted infection in the U.S., and it increases the risk of cancer in infected regions. And the reason for this is that human papillomavirus, as can many other viruses, uh, it can insert its genetic information into the DNA of the infected tissue. If this insertion alters genes that control the cell cycle, this can result in an abnormal mitotic index for that infected tissue that can result in cancer. It's been linked to 80% of cases of invasive cervical cancer, but most strains don't cause cancer. The treatment is difficult and somewhat controversial. Genital herpes is caused by herpes simplex type 2. This is characterized by latent periods and flare-ups of the disease. Congenital herpes can cause malformations of the fetus. And you have to remember, with viral infections, if the mother um, is in the first trimester, the fetus is, is at particular risk. Viruses are extremely small, and as a result, they can cross the placental barrier and make it into the developing embryonic and fetal bloodstream, where they can disrupt normal developmental processes. If this happens during the first trimester, we can see um, deficiencies in the musculoskeletal, uh, nervous, and cardiopulmonary systems, among many others. And this is why they caution mothers, particularly during the first trimester, to avoid exposure to infected persons. The treatment is acyclovir, which is an antiviral, as well as another host of antiviral drugs. In general, it's extremely difficult to treat viral infections because viruses make their living inside the healthy tissue of infected individuals, and they often hide in tissues that are refractory to the uptake of drugs. They can often um, lay dormant in these tissues for the bulk of the lifetime of the infected individual. Uh, viruses present fewer targets for drug therapy than um, free living pathogens do, such as protozoans and bacteria. Um, as a result, uh, we generally have to attack um, such components as uh, reverse transcriptase in the case of retroviruses, or unique coat proteins. Uh, due to the fact that viruses rely on host machinery to replicate, um, it, it also becomes more difficult uh, to uh, attack um, the ability of the viruses to reproduce because if we do that, we're actually attacking our own mitotic machinery. This also has another con consequence. Because viruses don't rely on their own reproductive machinery in order to reproduce, they can tolerate a much higher mutation index than can free-living pathogens. As a result, they can mutate 
away from the ability of certain antivirals to recognize and destroy them. So they present a true challenge. Okay. One of the things that we can do prior to the birth of the child is we can determine the sex. We can do this through ultrasound in uh, the third trimester, uh, or we can use amniocentesis or chorionic villus sampling while the developing uh, embryo or fetus is still in utero. Of the 46 chromosomes in the fertilized egg, one pair are the sex chromosomes. They come in two flavors, the X and the Y. Females are born with two X chromosomes. The ovum will always contain an X because the female is only capable of generating gametes using her genetic material. And since females are genetically XX, the haploid cells that are produced from the oogonia are only going to carry the X chromosome. So there's no such thing as a Y-carrying egg. However, males make the sperm, the motile gamete, which can either carry the X or the Y chromosome since men are genetically XY. So the man determines the sex of the child. An X-carrying egg and an X-carrying sperm will result in a female offspring, while fertilization with a Y-carrying sperm will generate a male offspring. The only trait that has been linked to the Y chromosome is the trait of being male. The SRY gene on the Y chromosome initiates testy development and the characteristic of being male. SRY stands for sex determining region of the Y chromosome and it is essentially a transcription factor. So how does um, sexual differentiation occur? Men and women um, exhibit sexual dimorphism. Women and men appear differently, have different external genitalia, and obviously contain um, different primary sex characteristics. In the male, that's the presence of testes. In the female, that's the presence of ovaries. But during development, we enter a sexually indifferent stage where the gonad gonads begin development in the fifth week as gonadal ridges. The paramezonephric ducts, if they are maintained, will become the future female ducts. So these will eventually form the fallopian tubes. They are lateral to the mesonephric ducts, which if they are maintained, will eventually form the vas deferens. In the sexually indifferent stage, both duct systems are present. Primordial germ cells migrate to the gonadal ridges to provide germ cells destined to become either spermatogonia or oogonia, depending again on whether or not the Y chromosome is present. The gonads begin development in the seventh week in males and in the eighth week in females. The genital tubercle forms the penis of the male and the clitoris of the female, while the urethral fold will form the spongy urethra of the male, enclosing the penile urethra or the labia minora of the female. Labioscrotal swellings will form the scrotum of the male, which contain the testes, or the labia majora of the female, which lie external to the labia minora. Both of these surround the vaginal opening. If testosterone is absent, all embryos will develop into females. And we know this because occasionally eggs can contain no sex chromosome whatsoever and be fertilized by an X-carrying sperm, which results in an individual that is uh, genotypically described, here I can show it to you, as XO, okay, and 44, okay, the 44 stands for the number of autosomes, those are the body chromosomes, and XO designates the state of the sex chromosomes. In this case, we have one X and we don't have any, any countervailing homolog homologous chromosome. And so this is a condition known as Turner syndrome. And in Turner syndrome, what we see are females who are physiologically immature throughout their entire life. They tend to be sterile. They have lower than... Um, normal amounts of estrogen and progesterone, and uh, they, they also have 
other physiological features such as a webbed neck. But other than that, there are they are phenotypically um, normal for a a female who has yet to enter puberty. Okay, so this results in a live birth. This is a genetic condition known as an aneuploidy. Okay, a n e u p l o i d y aneuploidy. Okay, aneuploidy means improper number of chromosomes. Now you might ask, why do aneuploidies occur? They occur because of an improper execution of meiosis, and generally at fault is the female gamete. Remember that the female is born with all the eggs she's ever going to create, and what happens as the menstrual cycle ensues from month to month is that each egg is older than the egg that was ovulated the previous month. Remember also that those eggs wait in the middle of meiosis, having already exchanged genetic material, having already achieved synapsis, and they have yet to complete meiosis and generate now the haploid gamete. It's in this state, if the eggs wait too long, that abnormal chemical attachments, covalent bonds, can occur between chromosomes, and when the egg attempts to complete meiosis, what happens is that extra genetic material can be dragged into a gamete or genetic material can end up being missing from a gamete. And the result of the fertilization of these old eggs is going to be a zygote that is aneuploid in nature. Now it turns out that aneuploidies of the sex chromosomes generally make it to live birth with the exception of an aneuploidy that would have say one Y chromosome and no countervailing X. So um, aneuploidies of the sex chromosomes are not as big a developmental catastrophe as aneuploidies of the autosomes, these remaining 44 chromosomes. Aneuploidies of the autosomes often result in stillbirth or spontaneous abortion. And the reason for that is that they contain a considerable amount of body plan information. So we have to keep in mind that most of the information on the sex chromosomes, on the X and on the Y, have to do with sexual identity and primary and secondary sex characteristics. The X chromosome apparently does, however, contain some body plan information. And we know that because the genes for uh, conditions such as hemophilia and color blindness also are located on the X chromosome. These are called sex-linked traits. While the Y chromosome has only one trait linked to it, again, the trait of being male. This is one of the reasons why they suggest that if women want to have children, they do so uh, prior to the age of 30, because after that, the number of aneuploidies per live birth increases between um, 20 to 30 percent. Okay, um, here we can see the maturation of the secondary sex characteristics of the, uh, of the fetus. Here we're looking at the sexually indifferent stage where we can spot the genital tubercle, the urethral groove, the labioscrotal swelling, and the urethral fold. You can also see now the anus and the tail. You still have a tail at this point because it has um, yet to recess and become the coccyx. Now what happens if we proceed down the male developmental pathway is that the glands penis will enlarge the labial scrotal swellings will um, become the scrotum, and they will later receive the testes as they descend through the inguinal canal, out of the abdominal pelvic cavity, and into the scrotal sac, guided by the gubernaculum. The labial scrotal folds will eventually seal at, at inferior midline of the shaft of the penis, and this will form now the male copulatory organ. And so you can see here that by the time we reach live birth, the testes have descended into the scrotum, and the penis is completely sealed. The glands penis is achieved inside the foreskin. And you can also see the anal opening. This area here is called the perineal rafe, okay? and this represents the seal at midline. However, if we look at female development, 
uh, we see a different series of events take place. The glans clitoris begins to shrink. The labioscrotal swellings form the labia majora, while the urethral folds form the labia minora. You can see here the anus again posterior to the vaginal opening. The um, glans clitoris continues to shrink and eventually we see the labia majora fully formed and the labia minora here interior to them around the urethral and the vaginal opening. Okay, so urethral opening, vaginal opening, anal opening. About two months prior to birth, testosterone will stimulate the migration of testes toward the scrotum if we're talking about a, um, a child that is genetically XY. The gubernaculum, again, is the tendon that guides the testy through the inguinal canal and in to the scrotal sac. The ovaries also descend but are stopped by a, the broad ligament at the pelvic brim. Okay, so the female gonad remains inside the abdominal pelvic cavity uh, and as a result the inguinal canal never exists in the female. So this has a particular risk for the male because this represents two permanent weaknesses in the lower abdominal pelvic wall through which abdominal pelvic organs can be pushed in the event of an inguinal hernia. And so here you can see the bifurcation of development. Um, what you're looking at uh, on the right-hand branch here is the series of events that eventually lead to the female reproductive uh, internal anatomy while well, here we see the events that lead to the male reproductive internal anatomy. Again, you can see the testes uh, beginning inside the abdominal pelvic cavity, descending down into the scrotal sac. And here you can see the ovaries uh, remaining inside the abdominal pelvic cavity, um, just medial to the fimbrae at the end of each fallopian tube, this being the uterus, the fundus, the fallopian tube, the ovary here. Okay. Notice also that in the female, the uterus sits atop the urinary bladder, uh, while in the male, the prostate gland sits underneath the urinary bladder. The prostate gland, the bulbo-urethral gland, the seminal vesicle, and the testes all contribute components to the semen. FSH and LH are elevated at birth, but they decline and remain low during the prepubertal pre, pre, pre years. The reproductive organs grow to adult size and become functional at puberty. This occurs in response to rising levels of gonadal hormones. The secondary sex characteristics appear, and this is the earliest time that reproduction is possible. Menopause marks the end of reproductive age for women. This has occurred when menses has ceased for an entire year. There is no equivalent to menopause in males. Males are fertile from puberty until death. Females are fertile from menarche until menopause. So males have a much longer reproductive life than females do. They also make many more gametes. Sperm do not sit frozen in meiosis. They are produced and either used or discarded. As a result, um, there, there are rarely, if ever, are aneuploidies that result from improper uh, production of sperm, at least as far as meiosis is concerned. Males continue to produce sperm well into the eighth decade of life, although the numbers and the motility of these sperm will decline. Declining estrogen levels in women result in an atrophy of reproductive organs and breasts and an irritability and depression in mood. Hot flashes occur as skin blood vessels undergo intense vasodilation and we also see gradual thinning of the skin and bone loss. This is um, basically early onset osteoporosis. We also see increased total blood cholesterol levels and falling HDLs. We can treat this with estrogen progesterone preparation the Women's Health Initiative research has reported that, however, these treatments can lead to increased risk of heart disease as well as increased risk of breast cancer and stroke as well as dementia. The smallest doses for the shortest time um, are adequate to reduce symptoms if there is no breast cancer 
or mutated BRCA gene. This is one of the primary risk factors uh, in certain types of familial breast cancer are mutations in this particular protein product. Okay, that brings us to the end of uh, the reproductive chapter, and I will see everybody in class.